Good evening. On behalf of the Indiana Commission for Higher Education, welcome for the first State of Higher Education Address. When grade school got underway this fall, one elementary teacher gave her students half of a famous saying and then asked the students to complete the sentences. The responses included, an idle mind is the best way to relax. A penny saved is not much. And my favorite response, you can't teach an old dog new math. <laughs> well, Indiana has no room for idle minds. A penny saved will, in education efficiencies, be reinvested in strategies for college completion. And as we prepare for the state budget process, we believe it is time for new math when it comes to higher education. I'm Marilyn Moran Townsend. I currently chair the Commission for Higher Education, and I represent the state's third congressional district. The commission is a 14-member public body that was created in 1971 to define the missions of Indiana's colleges and universities, plan and coordinate the state's post-secondary educational system, and ensure that Indiana's higher education system is aligned to meet the needs of the students and Hoosier families. The commission includes representatives from each congressional district, three at-large members, a college faculty representative, and a college student representative. The commission's work is guided by our strategic plan called Reaching Higher, Achieving More, and this plan was adopted last year as Indiana's new pathway to college completion, affordability, and academic quality. I do encourage you to read it. Tonight, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our MC for this event, Mr. Amos Brown. Amos is the Director of Strategic Research and the host and managing editor of the Amos in the Afternoons radio show on WTLC AM here in Indianapolis. Amos is an engaging and respected voice in the community, and he understands the critical need to have educational opportunity and success in Indiana for all of our Indiana students and families. I asked Amos what would be something that the audience might not know about him that I might share. He said, no, you can't share that. So what I will share is that he's very proud of the fact that his uh, alma mater just won a bowl game. No, not Alabama, Northwestern. It is my pleasure now to ask you to join me in welcoming Mr. Amos Brown. Thank you, Marilyn. Good evening. I guess when you have a tent an alumnus of Northwestern, we uniquely understand the high cost of higher education. And in my con yeah, I know. And in my conversations on radio and every day in our community, I know there is perhaps no topic more important on the minds of Hoosier families than that of education, both the opportunities it provides and the cost associated with it. And I'm privileged to serve on Indiana's Education Roundtable where I have the opportunity to listen and work with other Hoosiers and participate in policy discussions about our K through 12 and higher education systems and the role they have in preparing the citizens and workforce of the future. And tonight we have an opportunity to bring more Hoosiers into this important discussion of education beyond high school and how it can improve the lives of students and change our state for the better. Tonight, we are going to hear an address by Commissioner Teresa Lovers that's going to be followed by a response panel discussion with key Indiana leaders representing business, community, education, and government. This discussion is going to be framed by both Commissioner Lovers' remarks and the Commission's new Return on Investment Report, which is subtitled, How Hoosiers Can Get More for Their Higher Education Dollars. So we hope that you'll find this evening's discussion to be thought-provoking, that it jumpstarts a larger statewide discussion from Lake Michigan all the way down to the Ohio River about the value of higher education, and that you feel, those of you here and those of you watching on the web, either live or on the webcast, that you feel inspired to do something differently in your household or in your community because of it. 
Now it's my pleasure to introduce our main speaker of the evening, Indiana's Commissioner of Higher Education, Teresa Lubbers, appointed to that post in 2009. Prior to that, she served in our Indiana State Senate for 16 years as a leader on education and economic development issues, as the chair of the Senate's Education and Career Development Committee. As a legislator, Teresa Lubbers authored Indiana's charter school law and spearheaded efforts to promote full-day kindergarten and college and career readiness, among other initiatives. In the higher education arena, Teresa is served as commissioner and chair for the Midwest Higher Education Commission, as commissioner for the Education Commission of the States, as a member of the Blue Ribbon Commission on Higher Education for the National Conference of State Legislature, and she is chair-elect of the State Higher Education Executive Officers Organization. But what would you expect from a former high school English teacher? Teresa also has an undergraduate degree from Indiana University and her master's in public administration for the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard University. Please welcome Commissioner Teresa Lubbers. Good evening, Indiana students and families, educators and employers, policymakers and community leaders, and other Hoosiers around our great state who share a commitment to building a better Indiana through higher education. On behalf of the Indiana Commission for Higher Education, I want to ask Amos Brown to be, thank Amos Brown for being with us here this evening and express my appreciation to not only Amos, but to the students who helped to make this event possible and to the panelists who will be participating after our remarks this evening. Tonight's event is made possible because we really want to share the perspectives of a lot of Hoosiers and find out how Hoosiers are feeling about how we spend higher education dollars. This fall, Hoosiers heard a public address on the state of K-12 education. And later this month, Indiana's governor will discuss the state of our state. The timing of my remarks this evening is altogether fitting as higher education has become the common link between the aspirations of our young people and the economic prosperity of our state. Indeed, today, more than ever before, higher education is the key to unlocking our full potential, both as individuals and collectively as a state. It's important to note that when we refer to education beyond high school, we're talking about any form of quality education and training, including one-year workforce certificates, two-year associate degrees, four-year bachelor's degrees, and beyond. If Indiana is going to build a stronger workforce and economy, we need more individuals with higher education at all levels, especially when those credentials are linked to high-need fields and employer demand. It's no coincidence that Indiana's national rankings for average earnings at education level are nearly identical. We rank 40th among the 50 states in the number of adults with education beyond high school, and 41st in per capita personal income. It's not an overstatement to say that Indiana's future, the kind of state that we will be, has more to do with education than anything else. Like most of the Midwest, Indiana is in the midst of an economic transformation that requires more highly educated and skilled citizens. The traditional middle-class manufacturing jobs of Indiana's past largely have been replaced by advanced manufacturing positions. And while we remain the most manufacturing intensive state in the country, fewer and fewer of these jobs are held by high school graduates. Efforts are underway to diversify our state's economy with jobs that fulfill 21st century needs in healthcare, technology, and other fast-growing occupations that require education and training beyond high school. If we are going to raise Hoosier incomes, replace the middle wage, middle skilled jobs that have been lost in recent years, and propel Indiana forward, we must tackle our education and workforce preparation needs with a new sense of urgency and a shared commitment. At the Commission, we have set a big goal of increasing the number of Hoosiers with education beyond high school to 60% of the state's adult population by the year 2025. But Indiana's big goal faces a big gap. To put that 60% in context, 
less than a third of Hoosiers have completed high school, high, higher education today. And moving that number will be tough for Indiana, especially when you consider that only two states in the nation have a greater percentage of adults with a high school diploma as their highest level of education. But consider the alternative. Nearly two-thirds of the jobs in Indiana this decade will require more than a high school diploma. And what if states around us meet the 60% goal and swallow up the jobs and economic opportunities that Hoosiers need and deserve? We become a state of lesser opportunity as more of the available jobs favor higher skilled and more highly educated workers. This is not an inevitable course if we invest in the development of Indiana's human capital. In recent months, I've been traveling the state holding a series of meetings in local communities to discuss the increasing value and necessity of higher education. Not surprisingly, the conventional wisdom that college is worth it has been challenged by some. From the nightly news to conversations in coffee shops, we keep hearing more and more stories about the rising cost of college, growing student debt, and graduates who can't get a job. The concern felt by many families is real and understandable, but the fact remains that opportunities are greater, incomes are dramatically higher, and unemployment rates far lower for Indiana's college graduates. Over the past decade, Hoosiers with a college credential have maintained or improved their economic standing, while those with a high school education or less have, become, have begun to fall out of the middle class. Clearly, there will be jobs and pathways for people who have high school diplomas if they are aligned with workforce needs. But the general decline in the demand for low-skilled occupations must guide our efforts to increase the educational attainment of Hoosiers. Four out of five of the jobs that were lost in the recent recession were held by individuals with a high school diploma or less, and many of those jobs are not coming back. In the past decade, wages of workers with a high school education have fallen by over 11 percent. In the last year alone, one in four high school graduates was unemployed or underemployed, while unemployment rates for college graduates have remained relatively low even during the recent recession. Hoosiers with only a high school diploma are more than three times more likely to be unemployed today compared to those with a four-year degree. At the same time, students from low-income families who do earn a college credential are four times more likely to enter the middle class. The bottom line is, not only do college graduates have more options and higher incomes, but far greater security in both, st in both strong and challenging economic times. Fortunately, more Hoosiers than ever understand that a college credential is their passport to opportunity and prosperity. Across all income levels and demographic groups, student aspirations for higher education have never been greater in Indiana. Indiana's college going rate now exceeds the national average and enrollment at our public and private colleges is at an all-time high. Despite this encouraging progress, Hoosiers, both as individuals and taxpayers, aren't getting their full return on investment from higher education today. We have too few students who graduate and even fewer who graduate on time. We are producing too few degrees, especially in high demand fields. And we have too much student debt, especially for those who exit college with debt and no degree. This reality is made abundantly clear in part one of our return on investment report, which was released earlier today as a companion piece to the Commission's strategic plan, Reaching Higher, Achieving More. In a follow-up re report, the Commission will provide more detailed information for each Indiana college campus to assist students and families in making smart higher education decisions. Our return on investment report shows in very vivid terms that far too many Hoosiers start college and never finish and most do not graduate on time. Only three in 10 Hoosiers complete a four-year degree on time, and less than one in 10 earns a two-year degree on time. 
Some might ask, you know, why is it so important that students graduate on time? For starters, it's a question of cost. An additional year of college can cost a Hoosier student $50,000 or more in extra tuition, lost wages, and related expenses. But taking longer not only means students and taxpayers pay more, it also dramatically decreases the odds that students will graduate at all. Beyond increasing college completion rates and on-time graduation in particular, we must also do more to align the degrees our colleges produce with the needs of the state's workforce. To meet employer needs, we must double the number of college degrees and certificates produced annually, from 60,000 to 120,000 degrees by the year 2025, with a special focus on the high-need, high-paid jobs that Hoosier families need and the state's economy demands. All education matters. But the reality is that some college majors or fields of study provide higher salaries, have a greater impact on gaining and retaining employment, and offer more potential for upward mobility. That doesn't mean that everyone needs to be an engineer or a scientist, though we certainly need more of those. But it does mean that students should think carefully about the job opportunities and earning power for their degree before piling up a mountain of college debt. It's clear that the rising cost of college is having a chilling impact on the aspirations of too many Hoosiers. Nationwide, tuition has increased by almost 50% in the last 30 years, and the average tuition and fees at Indiana's public colleges have increased by nearly 100% since 2000. It's true that the sticker shock of college costs is often diminished by the net cost, the real cost of college after financial aid and scholarships have been applied. Nevertheless, two-thirds of Hoosiers graduate with debt, and outstanding student loan debt in this country recently hit the trillion dollar mark, eclipsing credit card debt. In Indiana, the average student debt upon graduation is more than $27,000, and our student loan default rate has increased by 35% in the last three years. A few weeks ago, the Wall Street Journal highlighted the experience of the Lowe family of Indianapolis as a part of a feature on soaring higher education costs. The Lowe's recently celebrated the accomplishment of paying off more than $127,000 in debt, most of it student loan debt. They actually threw a party, and people from as far as 200 miles away, many who didn't even know the Lowe's but had been following the experience on Ms. Lowe's blog, came to acknowledge the successful efforts to retire a burdensome debt. Though some may see the Lowe's story as either cause for celebration or a troubling tale of the growing debt dilemma, we should all be able to agree that prospects are far bleaker for students who exit college with debt and no degree. These Hoosiers lack the same job opportunities and earning potential as college graduates like the Lowe's and they are four times more likely to default on their student loans than those who finish a degree. This worst case is all too often, all too common in Indiana, and it results in limited options and long-term financial consequences for students, and a near zero return on investment for our state. So the question really isn't whether more Hoosiers need education beyond high school, but rather, how do we build a more efficient, student-centered, and responsive higher education system that produces greater value and return on investment for our citizens and our state. Our bottom line is ensuring that more Hoosiers earn quality degrees and credentials on time and at the lowest possible cost. This is a shared responsibility that must be owned jointly by the state, by Indiana's colleges and universities, and by Hoosier students themselves. Business as usual, won't get us to our big goal. And we are calling on each of these essential partners to take specific steps now to increase Indiana's return on investment. First, from the state. During the upcoming legislative session, the commission will be asking lawmakers to take action in three main areas. We must expect results from our colleges by sustaining support for a performance-based funding formula that drives dollars to colleges based on key success measures that include producing more on-time degrees and quality degrees 
especially in high need areas. Second, Indiana must reverse a downward trend in state support by investing more in higher education in the next budget. Yes, there will be a cost associated with increasing degree production and educational attainment, but we must pay for what we value to keep pace with the growing workforce demand for skilled college graduates. Finally, the state must create college completion incentives for students that award additional financial aid dollars to those who perform academically and graduate on time. The financial need of the student has always been and should continue to be the foundation of our financial aid system in Indiana. But we have an opportunity to encourage and reward Hoosiers for making smarter choices and staying on track for success. Now we turn our attention to Indiana's colleges and universities. First, the commission will recommend that an increase in state higher education funding during the next budget cycle be tied both to performance and an expectation that our colleges hold any increase in tuition and fees for Hoosier students at or below the rate of inflation. Second, we are asking our colleges to further support student success by promoting their own financial aid and on-time completion incentives that encourage students to graduate with minimal debt. Third, we are calling for a renewed emphasis on effective college advising practices that place students on a clear path to graduate on time and provide them with a true sense of the job opportunities and earning potential for their degrees. Finally, from Hoosier students. Students themselves are not without responsibility. Completion rates have stagnated. More students supersede normal graduation timelines, and many practice less than sound judgment in borrowing and spending. First and foremost, students must start college better prepared and with a clear plan to graduate on time in their program of study. Second, we're calling on students to borrow wisely and repay responsibly when it comes to managing their loan debt. A college degree continues to be a smart investment, but many students pile up debt without understanding what their total cost will be or how long it will take for them to pay it off. As a general rule, college students shouldn't borrow more than their expected annual starting salary after graduation. <laughs> Finally, if Indiana college students listening remember only one thing I've said this evening, it should be the following phrase, 15 to finish. 15 is the minimum number of credits that full-time college students must complete each semester to graduate on time. During last year's session, Indiana lawmakers passed legislation that streamline, streamlines college credit requirements and ensures that the vast majority of degrees can be completed in time if students take 50 credits each semester or 30 credits during the calendar year. Sadly, only half of students receiving state financial aid are taking 30 or more credits per year, yet three quarters of these students expect to graduate on time. In this case of shared responsibility, Indiana colleges and the state are working together to remove a barrier to on-time completion. Now students must do their part by committing to 15 to finish. As we consider new opportunities and approaches to help more Hoosiers complete higher education, it's important to note how our college-going population has changed over the years. The 18-year-old recent high school graduate who spends four years on a residential college campus is now the minority among all students in Indiana and the nation. While our residential campuses are serving even more students, the reality is that only one in five individuals who access higher education will ever live on a college campus. And more and more Hoosier students are taking advantage of online college courses and other innovative learning models that offer greater flexibility and accelerated degree completion without sacrificing quality. As our college population has grown and become more diverse, the level of support our students need has increased as well. The majority of Indiana college students today are working, commuting to campus, and trying to balance family and job responsibilities while furthering their education. Many students come to campus lacking the academic preparation they need to succeed in college. 
up to a third of all recent high school graduates and more than two thirds of our community college students arrive needing remediation that drastically decreases the chances of them earning a degree and because many hoosiers are the first in their family to go to college they often feel out of place or struggle to navigate the environment though i've focused the majority of my remarks on the shared responsibility of students and colleges and the state it's clear that the shared responsibility cannot end there our parents and families must place an active an ongoing role in helping their children plan, prepare, and pay for college from an early age. Our K-12 higher education systems must collaborate more closely to align expectations for, for students around common standards and measures that ensure Hoosiers graduate from high school, college, and career ready. And local community members must rally around the common cause of increasing college completion. Pathways for college and career success should be available to all students, those who have recently graduated from high school and those who are returning to school after years in the workforce. Whether you're a young Hoosier starting school or an adult thinking about returning to school, we must work together across Indiana to make sure you have the information, guidance, and support you need to succeed. With that goal in mind, over the past couple years, we have supported the development of college success coalitions in 50 counties across the state through our Learn More Indiana Outreach Initiative. Leadership is provided locally by representatives from K-12 and higher education, business and government, and community faith-based and youth-serving organizations. Collectively, these county coalitions have recruited more than 1,100 member organizations and implemented nearly 1,500 targeted activities designed to increase student success. Together, these local champions are creating a college-going culture, connecting students to mentors, helping Hoosiers navigate the college admissions and financial aid process, and much more. To sustain this growing statewide momentum, we'll be calling on local leaders to help us develop 20 new college success coalitions each year on a competitive basis until all 92 counties have an active local coalition working to increase the education level across Indiana. What can we expect if our collective efforts are successful? The payoff for Hoosiers means more opportunities, greater job security, and higher earnings. On average, Indiana College graduates will earn an, an extra $20,000 per year or more than $1 million over their careers compared to high school graduates. The payoff will be significant for the state, too. Indiana's economy, workforce, and middle class will be stronger. Tax revenues go up while health care corrections and other state costs go down. Even a one percentage point change in the number of people with a college degree leads to a 2% e increase in overall economic activity. If Indiana succeeds in meeting our big goal of 60% education attainment, average incomes will increase by more than $1,800 per person, and, and the annual state revenue will increase by $1.5 billion. I've talked tonight about the value of higher education, about shared responsibility, about the need to increase our return on investment as students and as a state. I've stressed the imperative to increase student success, decrease time to degree, and lower student debt. More than ever, education is dividing the haves from the have-nots in our country and in our state. Between those who have greater opportunities for economic independence and with a high quality of life, and those with limited choices and few options. If we recognize that higher education is the prescription for individual opportunity and a strong economy, we must have the courage and the will to take action. I would like to close this evening by sharing the story of one recent Indiana College graduate. Heather Barker's story is best told in her own words. Where I started out does not determine where I will go. I am the first member of my family to graduate from college. I worked through school. Growing up in a single-parent home, I watched my mother struggle to provide for us. I grew up fast, helping to care for my brother who has severe disabilities. My family supported me in every way they could 
And most of all, they believed I would succeed. They always told me how proud they were of me, and I never really understood why. To me, I was just doing what I had to do to have the life I wanted. Looking at where I came from, some people may wonder how I made it. In honesty, there was no other option. I knew I was going to go to college, and I also knew I would graduate. At times, though, my circumstances made me feel like I was different, as if there was something wrong with me. My mother was a single parent, my brother did not talk, and my father, well, he was either homeless or in jail. All of this made it difficult for me to connect with my peers. I felt alone and misunderstood. In college, I found my home in the University Writing Center, where I tutored college students from various language backgrounds and with varying writing abilities. Today, I want to use my degree, my experience, and my hope to help others realize their potential and achieve their goals of succeeding in higher education. I want them to know that they have choices and a future ahead of them, as long as they are willing to work for it. My story is a testament that it is possible. Indiana made an investment in Heather Barker as the recipient of a scholarship from Indiana's 21st Century Scholars Program. As a result of that investment, Heather completed college, and now she's helping other 21st Century Scholars like herself be successful by not only graduating, but also giving back and helping others complete college. Heather is ensuring that Indiana receives the best possible return on its investment. She's getting us another step closer to our big goal. In many ways, Heather's story is Indiana's story. Like Heather, where we started does not determine our future or where we go from here. Like Heather, we have a big goal before us. And though it may seem daunting, overly ambitious, or even impossible to some, it isn't really an alternative at all. Success is a shared responsibility, and each of us has a part to play. We must expect more to achieve more as a state, as communities, and as individuals. If there was ever a time for bold action to increase our return on investment, it is now, as we commit to make Indiana better and stronger through higher education. Thank you for listening this evening and for joining us in reaching higher and achieving more for our students and our state. Thank you, Commissioner Lovers. Thank you for that informative, inspiring, provocative address. And now, we've got a distinguished panel of four. I'm going to call them up to the stage, starting with Kevin Brinegar, who's the President and CEO of the Indiana Chamber of Commerce. He's been at the Indiana Chamber 21 years. Started out as a poor, lowly lobbyist, working <laughs> his way up to President and CEO. He's had experience in all forms of government and lobbying and understanding business. He has his Bachelor's of Science degree from Indiana University and a bunch of Master's degrees with majors and et cetera, also from Indiana University. Please welcome Kevin Brinegar. Thank you. Ne next, from the halls of academia, Beverly Pitts has, she's retired, she's President Emeritus of Indiana, of the University of Indianapolis. She's also the former provost of Ball State University, and she serves with Commissioner Lovers as co-chair of the Indiana College Completion Council. And her, she has her BA from Anderson University and an MA in journalism and a doctorate in higher education with a cognate, I don't know what a cognate is, but it sounds important, in journalism from Ball State University, <laughs> proving that, too, that yeah. you can be a journalist and run a university. Please welcome Beverly Pitts. <laughs> Bill Stanich. All right, here we go. Bill Stanjakevich is president and CEO of the Indiana Youth Institute. That's the statewide nonprofit for youth service providers. They partnered with the Commission for Higher Education through Learn More Indiana to create the Indiana College Success Mentoring Initiative. He's also happy that Northwestern yes, finally won a bowl game, bachelor's degree from the Medill School of Journalism, his master's in public administration from George Mason University that always makes it to uh, a final four every now and then. And he's an adjunct faculty member at Purdue University trying to lobby the new president for a raise. Please welcome <laughs> Bill Stajakevich. 
finally, from our Indiana General Assembly, Representative Bob Banning has served in the legislature since 1992, another veteran 21 years. He represents House District 91, which serves parts of Marion and Hendricks County. He's advocated for education reform throughout his tenure in the state, uh, in our state legislature. He's a lifelong Hoosier, small business owner, and his bachelor's degree is from Indiana University. Representative Bob Bainey, who chairs the House Education Committee. Let me start with Beverly Pitts. You have served at the head of a private university, of a public university. You've got this unique vantage point in this discussion. So, and now you're retired, so you can say what you really want to say. So how can Indiana's colleges and universities deliver this greater return on investment? Well, um, I can say anything I want to, but I certainly don't want to hurt the feelings of my colleagues in higher education. Um, it occurred to me that uh, Teresa's remarks, which I thought were excellent, uh, helped uh, remind me of when we say higher education, we are talking about the most diverse component of the state probably that there is. I mean, think about the differences in the kinds of institutions we're talking about from an IU, a Purdue, a Ball State with major research agendas and graduate programs to a small liberal arts college of maybe 1,500 people to uh, Western governors, to the proprietary institutions that are basically um, selling courses one at a time, uh, 31 private institutions in the state. So I do have a kind of interesting perspective in that I perhaps have seen both sides of that, and we don't have very many opportunities where the, the private schools, the public schools, and the proprietary schools all get to work together. Um, I just wanted to remind us of how diverse the organizations are we're talking about, um, that's actually good because it creates wonderful competition and it creates wonderful opportunity, but it can also be difficult because we can't always grasp exactly what it is we want them to do and they can't do everything exactly the same. I do think, however, a lot of things are going on though in the higher education community that many of them you know about, many of them perhaps not, that are already moving towards being more efficient, being a, a better return on investment. Let me speak first just about the state as a whole. The return on investment in, in the state for something like the research that's produced that creates jobs at our major research institutions is significant, and we shouldn't forget that that's a part of that whole piece too. But in addition to that, I think that um, some of the very small private schools have a very, very high graduation rate, and. The private schools are producing 35% of the baccalaureate degrees in the state for essentially a 3% investment of state money in terms of the, the SASE grant. So we're getting a good return on investment there too. There are many other things that we could talk about that are going well for us. But I'll say some things that I think can, we can continue to work on. One of them is to make the degree more obtainable. Uh, and I know many institutions are doing this, looking again at the requirements for the degree, perhaps even decreasing the number of hours for programs, uh, re-examining the idea of you know just adding on and adding on just doesn't happen anymore. For one thing, I, I always want to say this because I think it's important to remember, competition is a great thing and it drives higher education. We're, we're in a competitive environment, so there are a lot of things that are happening that are by nature going to make it better for the consumer because of that competition. Uh, I can guarantee you that in the private sector, they don't just raise tuition because they can raise tuition, and I know that's absolutely true on the public sector as well, because there are so many driving factors to keep it down, to keep it competitive, uh, and to pour resources in to make it financially feasible for students. But many other things are going on as well, and many things that, that I think we can do better. For one thing, the way the degree is offered. Now there are many opportunities. Yes, there's still the great residential experience, and we should never lose that. It's very important that we have that culture of the 18-year-old experience. But as uh, Commissioner Lebers was saying, most students are not that age. And now there are course by course, program by program opportunities, ways to, quote, buy courses one at a time. Uh, the distance learning opportunities are huge now. Think back to just, you know, when, when many of you were in school, there wasn't even such, there was a correspondence course, maybe. And now there are literally thousands of ways in which that can 
can take place. Transferability is something we can work more on. We can do a better job at transferability and assessing those courses and finding ways for them to count. Probably the thing, though, that I think we could do better is work together as institutions, and we're certainly trying to do that, uh, finding ways in which um, specific missions can match up with other missions, that the, uh, what each institution does well, it does, uh, and we don't find ourselves, you know, maybe overbuilding the store, so to speak. Um, I think there are many things like that that can happen. Another thing is uh, what's happening with summer school. So we have year-round school, opportunities to, to make sure that 30 hours happens. Even the concept of the hours, you know, does it really need to be in hours? There are other ways, and many, many schools have programs where there are ways to get credit for uh, experience, and m I think every, every institution on the private sector has some kind of a program for adults returning. I think one of the most difficult things we face, though, is finding those adults, finding the way in which those the students who have not yet completed a d degree find what they need, uh, and I'll end because I have many colleagues that want to say things too. Probably the thing we can do the best and that is the most important thing is to find a mentor, a person who can work with each student, and I mean the adult student, and, and, and there are literally thousands of them out there doing that, but it's a difficult system to work your way through. And when you're 18, you don't, you don't think about when, maybe you think when you're 22, but you're not thinking about when you're 40. And so there's some guidance that's needed there all the way through the system, and I think better planning all the way back to, I know Bill will talk about this, but the K-12 involvement. Every, every college and university is already involved, much, much more than ever before. So a lot of good things are happening, a lot of new things are happening. We're, we're headed in the right direction, but there's still an awful lot of work to do. Kevin Brittinger, let me ask you, when I went to school, my mm -hmm. professors kept saying, what we're teaching you here, they're not teaching you in the real world because the real world doesn't understand it, I understand it here. Then when I get to the real world, hey, your professors didn't know, mm -hmm. you know what, we know what's mm -hmm. real. Is that the disconnect we hear about today between higher education and the business community, or is it a different disconnect than what my professors told me back when McKinley was president? McKinley was president. Um, I think there, you know, there may be some, some disconnect uh, between higher education and the business community, but I'm more concerned about the disconnect between the business community and students and those who advise them and help them decide what to major in, what classes to take, even all the way down in high school to prepare themselves for the career that they, they think they might want. I think, uh, and this may surprise you here, I, th I think that the business community needs to step up and those who represent the business community like the chamber and do a better job of communicating to the students and to the higher education institutions what their needs are, what the skills they are, so that there is a greater awareness. And, and we're trying to do some of that through initiatives like uh, our new indianaskills.com initiative. I'm, I'm encouraged by uh, what I see as, as an increasing attentiveness by the higher education institutions to uh, the needs and the desires and the skill levels of the business community and what I see as uh, increasing attentiveness to the, the success of the students and taking more ownership and responsibility for making sure that students do matriculate to the next grade and do complete their degrees and do get the credentials they need uh, for the skills they want. Let me follow up quickly because you, you raised an interesting issue. The commissioner talked about the responsibility students have. Yes. in this 15 to finish. We all know when we went to college of friends and roommates and what have you who may have started a majoring in this and then six months later they decide they want to major in something else and then in their sophomore year they change their major again and then maybe by their junior year they finally locked in and they may have gone mm -hmm. to three or four different majors before they had to finally lock in. Are we at a point now in the 21st century where you gotta stop that now? You almost, when you walk in that door freshman year, you gotta know what you want? I From think the there, there's always going to be situations where students change majors, but I think we as adults, so to speak, uh, need, to, need to do all we can to keep that to a minimum and b by informing the students and their parents about career opportunities, about requirements, 
you know, some students that I know that you that you describe mm -hmm. uh, change majors because the first major was too hard, mm -hmm. or they think it was too hard, or they fall behind, or in some cases their interests change. But to the extent that we can hone that down and, and minimize it, uh, then we get what the commissioner was talking about, which is an overall better return on investment for higher education, and we minimize uh, or reduce the incidence of students taking on debt, uh, taking some classes for a year or two, and then not getting the degree or the credential they need uh, to obtain the job that they want or need to live their life and pay back the debt. The other thing I would say is uh, I think business and higher education uh, need to do all that we can to communicate down into the K-12 level what the uh, requirements and the, the, the skills and the desires are. And as one example, it almost boggles my mind that in the 21st century, um, high school guidance counselors work the same school year and the same school day as the teachers, mm. which means that they rarely interact with parents. Good point. Uh, and if I were king, uh, <laughs> I would uh, I would put my high school guidance counselors on 12-month contracts and tell them that in the summer months they are to get their behind out into the community to talk to employers to find out what their job requirements are, what their skills are, and get out and talk to your institution, your post-secondary institu institution and find out what uh, the skill requirement, the, the achievement requirements are for those students to succeed and not have to go through remediation. And then I would also require those, uh, I'd put those guidance counselors on schedules that provide for evening hours, mm. a couple times a week and on Saturday mornings so that they've got, they have time available when the parents can okay. come in and available and come in and talk to them. Sounds like a piece of legislation to me, <laughs> Representative Benning. Given the fact that in the first quarter of odd numbered years in Indiana, you all are the most popular people to the folks in higher education. I haven't yet <laughs> figured that out. Uh, but given that we're in the upcoming session, what from your point of view is the state's commitment to higher education and what higher education issues are likely to be considered because everybody's on their best behavior and, and I think it, I'm, I'm confident it's gonna stay that way till April 30th. I'm sure you're right. Um, I do believe though, uh, as uh, Teresa has said, that we will continue, Indiana was kind of a leader in terms of performance funding for higher ed. We are gonna continue down that pathway. I think that we wanna make sure every dollar we invest in higher ed has a return and, and a return on graduation or completion of uh, some sort of degree, their degree or certification. So we'll continue that. I'm hopeful you know, that we're, we're fortunate in Indiana to be uh, blessed with a surplus that we hopefully will be able to invest not just in higher ed, but in higher ed and K-12 and hopefully uh, improve the, uh, reduce the increase in tuition because there's a, obviously across the country there's been an increase in college tuition as states have reduced the amount of support they've had to our state universities. So hopefully we may be able to reverse that a little bit. Um, I know that we've been spending a lot of time too uh, talking about how we can eliminate remediation and uh, so that those students don't come to our institutions of higher ed and have to be remediated because those, we know that those students that have to remedi be remediated are more likely not to be able to complete school. So we're looking, I have a bill that will uh, require Accuplacer be taken in 11th grade for those students who look like they're not going to be able to pass ECA so that hopefully we can do remediation in the K-12 system rather than pass that cost on to our higher ed system, which uh, is another cost that is burdening the system. Um, one of the things I know that we're also looking at, um, I would like to see if I were king, as Kevin were, <laughs> um, I would create an office of uh, accountability and innovation. Uh, data has become so important to all of us as we drive any of our decisions, um, where we would pull together. I know that Teresa has asked for IWIS. I believe that what we need to do is kind of blow up the system, take preschool data all the way to workforce and have it all together in a longitudinal system where we can track students and make certain that we are 
making decisions correct in our institutions of higher ed that will meet the needs of the workforce so that we can kind of um, longitudinally track that and make sure we are more successful in our uh, placement in our jobs. And then, um, as Teresa said, I think we're going to do more to probably try to encourage students to graduate on time, give them incentives for that. There's no question that it saves the state money, it saves us money, it saves them debt, uh, all focused on really trying to get those students out, getting them tax-paying Hoosiers so that they will be successful uh, and really focus on uh, all those things. One other item that I know uh, our caucus is um, succinctly focused on, and that is uh, not just uh, higher ed and the emphasis of college, but more on certification and trying to work with some of our workforce cen centers, our economic development uh, uh, creation um, entities across the state, bringing all of them together and kind of create a new council uh, and hopefully create a connection between what we have as far as education and the jobs that are available out there. As Teresa said, we are a definitely a manufacturing state, but we do know that um, those one and two year certifications can bring forth a middle uh, income uh, for our Hoosiers and it's something we also need to focus on. So you'll, I think, see all of those things kind of, plus many more as we move forward in this session. And Bill, he talked, the representative talked about remediation, reducing that cost. That brings up the achievement gap. What can organizations like yours, what can our community-based organizations all around this state, what do they need to be doing to try to deal with the remediation, reduce the achievement gap at the same time? You know, Amos, there was an interesting study by Cal Berkeley, a guy by the name of David Kerp, who looked at a wide range of programs to close the academic achievement gap. Some were public, some were nonprofits, some were faith-based, some were funded by government, some by foundations in the private sector, some a mix of all of the above. The good news was several of the programs worked, and they all had one thing in common, a continuous supply of individual attention. A continuous supply of individual attention uh, to those students in need. And I would just associate with what Dr. Pitt said uh, about the need certainly for families to be involved, parents are uniquely responsible and uniquely influential in the lives of their kids. But if kids are not able to get assistance at home, then the community can step up through mentoring programs as we see through Indiana College Success Mentoring funded by the Indiana Commission of Higher Education. You know, uh, Amos, I look at two main gaps for our students and their families. One is the information gap. We have so many programs and so many resources that too many of our students just don't know about. They don't know what they don't know, especially amongst our low-income neighbors who would be the first in their families to obtain education after high school. We did a survey of low-income parents, and they don't even know the basics in terms of what are the exams and when are the deadlines, uh, to Kevin's point, about getting them the information yeah. that they need, about the tests and the financial aid forms. And, and the, the main theme from that survey was, I'm so afraid I'm going to miss something. And then you look at our students, a survey from uh, Learn More that found that just one-fourth of our low-income students know how to apply for need-based financial aid. Now, Indiana is in the top 20% in America in the dollars that we make available directly to the students. And the students most eligible don't know how to apply for that money. That's a, a serious information gap. Another example, just 8% of our students pursue the technical honors diploma. I certainly resonate with the commissioner's comment about the one-year certificate and the two-year associate's degree. Well, the path in high school is the technical honors diploma, and yet fewer than 10% of our students pursue that degree track that at the age of 18 or maybe 20, with additional education after high school, can lead them to a job today. I was just in Princeton. The folks at Toyota told me with that technical honors diploma and a little bit of education after high school, they have jobs, Amos, open today that pay sixty to seventy thousand dollars in full health benefits but how many kids know about that track certainly not enough when the percentage is eight percent and then lastly is the aspiration gap that even when these students have the information they still don't believe it's for them uh, the new york times in uh, reporting on these teenagers of this type said we're not talking about hopes that were dissipated we're talking about hopes that never developed in the first place and so we need to close that information gap in terms of all the programs and resources that are out there. We need to close the aspiration gap so that more kids believe in possibility, believe in opportunity, believe that success is for them. And the way that our low-income neighbors tell us the best way to reach them, uh, who would be first in their families to, to get uh, education after high school, is through people they know, 
and organizations they trust. People they know and organizations they trust. Certainly through schools where the kids are already. But you know, Amos, I think about Tate's Barbershop on West 10th Street. Right. And I think about Shepherd Community Center on East Washington and Cahoots Cafe up in Angola and Youth Resources down in Evansville and Bruce Daigie's Boys and Girls Club in Richmond and the Outstanding Big Brothers Big Sisters program in Terre Haute. Those are the people they know and the organizations they trust. And all of us need to get the information to those folks and the mentoring organizations to close these gaps. When that happens, we'll get a better return on investment for higher education in our state. Got about two minutes left. I want to go to each of you very quickly. What's the biggest thing that you can tell folks that are watching this webcast, watching us now, watching on delayed, that we need to do in Indiana to, to improve our higher education? Bill, quickly. Uh, I just think of uh, Abraham Lincoln called our economic system that people had the right to rise. We, more Hoosier youth need to know that they have that right. We need to help them maximize that right, and we'll do so by closing the information gap and the aspiration gap through people they know and organizations they trust. Beverly? I think uh, what I said earlier about the mentors or the connectors, Bill talked about it too, finding a way in which every single student can have someone who can help them through this system. Representative? I would say that um, the data component is very important to all of us as we try to make decisions. I don't know that it dire relates directly to those at home, but as we make decisions that are best for students across the state, that a good, solid data system is going to be very important for us in the future. Kevin. Developing talent, qualified, skilled talent, is the biggest challenge facing our state, and it should be our number one priority. Uh, related to that, we need to invest, uh, and we need to, to be laser focused in how we use those scarce resources and make sure we're investing in things that provide a good return on investment and uh, incent the things that we want to occur, uh, such as you know, high, high skill, high demand areas. Uh, we need to look to find ways to incent both the students and the institution uh, to produce graduates with those credentials. The commissioner talked, and I got about a minute left, the commissioner talked about wanting half of all Hoosier adults to be college graduate. That's a great aspirational goal. Should part of this effort be to convince Hoosiers we can do this? Absolutely. Uh, absolutely, and, and, and Commissioner Lovers in the remarks talked about the, the cultural problem that we have. Um, and you know, I frequently talk about the fact that, that it is unacceptable in a okay. 21st century knowledge-based economy to and I'm going I'm I'm to hold you right there because somebody just talked in my ear. And as a college graduate, I learned when they talk <laughs> in your ear, you got to move on. Please thank Beverly F F Pitts, Kevin Brinegar, Bob Benning, Bill Stannis, Kevin. Please thank our panel. And on behalf of Commissioner Teresa Lubbers, we want to thank you, those of you that are here live with us this evening, those of you that are watching all across the state. Thank you very, very much. And yes, we can do it. You can do it. Your kids, your grandkids can do it. They want to go to college. They want post-secondary education. They can do it. There's money available. I'm going to work on the legislator over here to make sure it's there. If you believe it, we can do it. I'm Amos Brown. It's been a privilege to be here with you tonight. Good night. Included.